Okay, so first I'll just, oh, okay, just making sure, there we go. First, just introducing myself if you were not on the call yesterday. My name is Jazz, Jasmine Porter, and I'm an international yoga instructor, soul coach, and sound therapist. So I do a lot of things all over. And mainly my intention is just to help people heal on a really deep level and have the best experience that you can possibly have. So my intentions for today, I have some really great content. I have some really deep questions and I hope you get so much out of it. Um, so just a little bit of an introduction to what soul coaching is. It's really uh, me helping you go through whatever process you need to, to live your biggest, boldest version of yourself. And when you think about like when you're a kid, you eat your vegetables, it might not taste good, might not feel good, but it's ultimately good for you. And so something about my style of coaching is it's whatever is truly, truly best for you. And I think in a lot of these spaces with the Zoom calls and with just self-care Sundays and like all these things that we've created culturally and like the spiritual culture, everyone thinks that healing is associated with feeling good. And just to kind of give you a new definition of what healing is, healing can be very uncomfortable. And polarity and discomfort is what really helps you get to a space where you feel like you're making a change. And then that gives you the indicator. Once you get comfortable with that discomfort, you realize that you're growing and you're changing, where you can be presented with the same situations, the same challenges, but you don't cry this time or it doesn't hurt your feelings this time, or you don't mistreat yourself this time, you know? So the topic for today is going to be the Black woman's relationship with rest, stress, and self-care. So before we dive deep, just to give you guys like a little testimony about my journey as a woman of color, I definitely have seen a complete turnaround with my experience as far as what I consider to be stressful, what my relationship is to the world, what my experience is. And it's been from all these really deep understandings about my perspective, fear, relativity, and expectations that I'm placing and things that I had the power to change in my own experience has completely changed when I'm manifesting and what I'm experiencing. So today I just want to give you as much power as you can possibly have, because that's the only thing we can control is ourselves. Can't change the world, can't change how anyone looks at us, how anyone treats us, but you have so much more in your control than you think. So um, let's go with acknowledgement first. Um, so acknowledgement is just a really important part of the transformational process, because before we can be accountable about how we're showing up for ourselves and what we can change, we always wanna feel like our situation our hurt, our whatever, our traumas are acknowledged first. So we're definitely gonna dive into some acknowledgement first. Um, and before we go there, just to give you all some tools because some of these questions, we're gonna go through a series of eight questions and some of them will be really challenging. So giving yourself some tools, you can close your eyes, you can take a deep breath, you can meditate, you can put your hand on your chest, you can stop your video and take a moment for yourself if you need to. So just remember that. So let's go ahead and just take a clearing breath together. <clears throat> Hi, Emeralds. Good to see you. Okay. Uh, so go ahead and ground yourself wherever you are, just sitting comfortably. We're not going to go into a full meditation, but just to release anything that you're holding on to if you didn't take a deep breath today. Okay. And gently close your eyes, start to relax and soften your shoulders, lifting up, sitting up tall, make sure you're leading with your heart and growing into your crown. Take a deep inhale, expand your ribs to your fullest capacity. Exhale, sigh out through your mouth. Returning to a normal breathing pattern, just sitting with yourself, starting to feel and notice anything in your body, any movement, any tension, any stagnant energy, anything that particularly feels really loose, really open, and just noticing. Start scanning from the top of your head down to the tips of your toes. And as you're scanning your way down, any tension that you feel, use your exhale as an opportunity to soften that space, let something go. So 
So we're just going to set an intention to be open, to be vulnerable, to be receptive, and to acknowledge that everything that we share in this space is based in love. It's all for the greatest good of our own experience. And we're all open to receive whatever is going to heal us that we can share within our own experience and that we can share with other women of color. And once you feel comfortable with that intention and you feel committed, take a final inhale, expand and breathe that in. And when you're ready, let go. Hmm. Go ahead and soften your eyes, come back to the space. Hmm. Oh, we, y'all are, first of all, so adorable and I feel emotionally ready to cry already. <laughs> I think I'm most emotional because uh, Black women are so amazing and so beautiful and so capable. And a lot of us don't know that. And I just wish that this one conversation could go out to the whole world, but we'll start with us, okay? Okay, so the first question, so I'm gonna ask these questions. Feel free to write out the questions if you want to, but the most important part is that you answer it in your own words. And then I'll have a few of you just respond and we'll have a little dialogue for each one. So the first question is, in addition to being a black woman, how do you identify as a person? You can write as many things as you want to or one thing. Okay. So for myself, I identify as a healer, a creative, a lover, and a teacher, in addition to being a Black woman. Sienna, what about you? <laughs> Hit your mute button. <laughs> <laughs> I need a little bit more time. Take your time. Who's ready? Just take a moment, keep writing. And this is also a great opportunity because sometimes this is a question that no one asks themselves. They take the societal identifiers and they're like, okay, I'm a mom, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm short, I'm tall, I'm whatever. And that's who I am in the world. But giving yourself the power to choose and acknowledging that you're so much more because when we get caught up in the social ones that are uh, causing us pain or political, social issues and injustices, you forget that there's so much more to who you are. So take a few more moments and think about that. Let's take about 30 more seconds. Emerald, you ready? Yes. Uh, so I wrote down educator, lover, mm -hmm. sister, soror, uh, foodie, natural hair enthusiast. I'm a learner um, and a generational curse breaker. I am in love with all of those, especially the naturalista part. <laughs> That's great. 
anyone else? Um, I would like to say something. I identify as a lover, a healer, a caretaker, a crutch at times, mm. a powerful mind, an energizer, a temple. Mm. That's beautiful. Anybody else? <laughs> Mama Armani over there like, <laughs> you proud of your babies? <laughs> things that were said um oh. and it's inspirational to hear everybody else's stuff because it reminds you too of stuff that you identify with that you might not have thought of right what's on your list um i have a sister a writer intellectual creative teacher adventurous nurturer and a spiritual being and i love emerald's generational curse what did you say, generational curse breaker yeah i need that Amazing, amazing, amazing. Anybody else? And feel free to take from anything that you heard and add it. Were you gonna say something, Sienna? I can share, yeah. Um, so I identify as a leader, mm -hmm. um, a vegan, a lover, and um, a student of life. Mm -hmm. I'm taking that one. <laughs> Okay, amazing. And feel free to like jot down if you felt like you needed to add more, it was difficult to get through that question to write the question down and revisit it later when you um, write in your journal tonight. So the second question is, what can be acknowledged about your experience as a black woman that would make you feel more understood? If someone or the world could give you some acknowledgement and acknowledge your experience, your pain, your wins. What is it that could be acknowledged that would make you feel more understood? So I'm still going to give you time to write because that one takes a little bit more than the first one. Um, but just to give you some context based on my own answer, um, and I actually have two answers. So the first thing is that I'm unique and I'm not required to be like anything other than what I am. And the second thing is 
who I am and my experiences cannot be generalized based on people who look like me. And I'll ask the original question one more time if you forgot. What can be acknowledged about your experience as a Black woman that would make you feel more understood? And whenever anyone is ready, feel free to unmute yourself and share. And to go a little bit deeper into this question, tap into when you think about feeling generalized or um, categorized, what is the thing that is upsetting about that? What is the thing that feels like it's not in alignment? What's the point that you would like people to understand? What can be acknowledged? And those conversations happen within ourselves. It happens when we watch certain content. It happens when we're in certain rooms or around certain people. So just really dropping into yourself and thinking about what has been my issue or my thing that I would really like people to get for me to feel understood. We'll give it 30 more seconds. Just got to finish your final thought. Okay. And even if you don't have a full thought, just start talking in the direction that you felt like you were going. Sierra, what do you have? I just kind of wrote on like kind of like my own personal feelings and thoughts. I just 
have been feeling like just lately as like I move towards, you know, graduation that, um, that I feel like us as black women, like in our demographic that like, we can't like afford the same amount of like risk and mistakes. And I've had a lot of people telling me lately, like my mentors who are, you know, not black and they're usually white that it's okay not to know what like I want yet or like know what direction I'm going. But I've like, I personally feel like the repercussions are a little bit different when you're, you know, a bit indecisive. Um, I've like kind of been feeling like it's like hard for me to re relax. Like I'm always like pushing, pushing to be the best or do a lot of things. And I just feel like lately, like as, um, like I'm always hearing that like different studies, surveys and polls that um, there's like so many different factors that are like uncontrollable that are working against us. Um, like I'm in a research lab now and there's no one that works, looks like me. And, and I was like uncomfortable a little bit, but he was just kind of, he was trying to do his best to like, you know, kind of be inclusive and teach others that were in our research lab. And he's just, he pre presented on this topic and just it, like basically said that it's really hard for like black women and like the STEM uh, careers to like succeed and stuff. So, and I was trying to ex explain to him why I feel like this pressure all the time to, you know what I'm doing, what my next steps are. And I just felt like lately, like a lot of people just don't understand like why I feel this type of pressure and it's, as a black woman, that's how I feel. That's lately, that's been, I wish that people understood more as to why I, I feel that type of pressure. You know what I mean? Mm. So, Cause I don't want to miss out any like opportunities or anything like that when there might be like already less already, you know? So. So let's put that into a solid sentence. I would like people to acknowledge the pressure that I feel pertaining to I would like people to acknowledge I don't know, in a sentence I know like I'm really bad at like articulating how I feel to be personally um you did really really good <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> thanks let's just kind of come in on the focus point um acknowledge you feeling challenged as far as the opportunities or the perspective of others all of it more i think all of it i think all of it i think uh i just i think the stress of just all just like all these like different factors just i feel like that are like potentially working against me that like i can't you know, seem to get past, you know what I mean? Just potentially, you know, just my skin color or just my gender or just, you know, my background, you know what I mean? So that just makes me feel stressed a little bit because I feel like I can't like afford the same risk or mistakes, you know, as other people, you know, I'm not given the same amount of tools potentially. So that's just, that's how I feel. <laughs> it was an amazing point. So a lot of things that I will do throughout our conversation is mm -hmm. bring it back to spirituality as far as what's for us. And one thing about entering spaces and having experiences or not being allowed to enter into a space, our perspective on things is based in a lot of different things. So there's this ancient Chinese proverb that is between a son and his father. He comes home from school and he's like, dad, I got straight A's, isn't that great? And the dad is like, maybe. And then he's like, okay, comes home the next day. He's like, I broke my arm, isn't that terrible? And he's like, maybe. And just really conceptualizing the concept of sometimes a missed opportunity can be internalized a certain way and yes, totally acknowledging that some people do have issues with certain people being in spaces. Some people are making a conscious effort to um, hinder people's expansion or people's elevation. And that can be true. However, anything that deters you into a different direction, being more connected to allowing that happen and it being flow rather than resisting it because you want it to go in that direction. And it truly was pushing you in a situation that is for your path. And the way that we know things are for us is because it happens. 
True. Very true. True. Mm, that true. was really beautiful. Anybody else? Thank you, Sierra, for sharing that. That was such a great um, topic. Thanks to for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, going once, going twice. We'll move on to the next one if nobody else is ready. Definitely take that note in your journal to expand more on that. Um, because acknowledgement is important because one thing is we have to remember that we have so much power to acknowledge ourselves and a lot of times looking for external acknowledgement, you may never get it. You probably won't get it in a lot of different situations. Um, but does that mean stay miserable? Does that mean be a victim? Does that mean be powerless? Does that mean feel defeated? No, there's so many other things we can do and that's what we're gonna go into. So the next question, <clears throat> what are the shared narratives that we believe about being a black woman in relationship to the world? In other words, what is the black female experience? This question came directly from yesterday. There was someone, I can't remember who it was, but someone was saying something along the lines of, because you know, the world is not set up for us. That is a narrative that could or could not be true, but it is a narrative that as a collective, a lot of black women attach to. And the danger, in attaching to that, continuing to repeat something and tell yourself that, it starts to be true as far as your power is concerned. And blanket statements like that are also dangerous because there's a million possibilities in the world. This world, I'm gonna tell you right now, is completely your oyster. You can have everything in it. It is for you. So, start to think about other things that you feel like you hear often in the black female circle, things that are narratives that we continue to say and claim that are a part of our conversation. What are some of those narratives that we have? Let's take about 60 more seconds on this one.
Okay. Chantel, you got anything? Uh, yeah. So the shared narrative that I'm acknowledging is we aren't represented enough. Mm. Like we all feel like we're not like out there as black women. Like we don't see enough of us in some places. Like some places that we go, we might not see ourselves or we might not feel like ourselves because we aren't, you know, incorporated in some things. And also like, it's hard for us to be loved or cared for. Like we all get that like feeling like black women are like hard to like cherish or, you know, even understand or get. So in my experience as a yoga instructor, there's so many people that come to me because I'm black. They feel safe, they feel comfortable. The music is gonna be relatable. They feel like they know me because I look like them. And that's beautiful. Um, and I hear so many people, there's so many big like um, yoga journal, all of these, especially once the Black Lives Matter um, huge movement happened over the summertime. Everyone was just speaking about, speaking out about representation in the classroom and people saying, I feel uncomfortable when I walk into a yoga class and it's only white people there. I put my mat down and they look at me crazy. Or feeling like they go into a store and people are watching them. Um, and so one thing about the whole concept of looking for people that look like you, there's a lot of safety that you feel amongst people in your own ethnic group, especially if you feel like you've suffered some sort of trauma or discrimination as a group. And there's such an opportunity to still feel at home even when you don't see yourself. So it's kind of like, in some cases, a security blanket. I'm gonna feel safer if I look around and see another brown face. But there's so many opportunities. We have to remember too that race is a concept that was made up. There's this book called The Invention of Race, and I highly recommend it. But we have to remember that as a people, there's an opportunity to connect with anyone. And that thing that makes you feel uncomfortable, that thing that makes you feel self-conscious is something that we've been taught from Western culture. So it's a whole nother opportunity for you to be the only black person and feel empowered by that. I remember when I started wearing my Afro out completely and I had a friend who was a black woman and she was like, I just can't believe you're gonna wear this natural hair to work. I can't believe, <laughs> like, what are the bosses gonna say? And we would go in public and she would just be so personally uncomfortable that my hair was natural and just wanting to minimize herself and shrink herself because she was the minority in the room. And I'm like, I really feel extra special when I'm the only black person in the room. My skin looks great, my hair is big. I don't know, like, <laughs> I think I'm winning in this situation. <laughs> Actually, I like, okay, so when I was working in the hospital, like, I used to wear my hair, like, in so many, like, natural styles, and it wasn't, like, a lot of me in there. I usually seen, like, you know, doctors and nurses walking around. Not, a, not many of them were Black, but when I used to wear my hair natural or in different styles, they'd be, like, amazed, and I used to take pride in that because, like, it was, it's like, yeah, it was like, I, I feel like I'm being like a, I don't know, like a role model or something for like accepting myself in a whole different setting. Because it, I used to be myself around everyone else. Us changing, so that feeling insecurity because I'm the only one is something that we do have the power to change. I mm -hmm. feel special and beautiful. And I know that y'all are looking because I'm the only one in here. And I know that my hair is incredible and your hair can't do that. And it's okay. And it's not a better or worse thing. It's that I'm just choosing not to feel like I need to shrink or I'm less than because of the numbers. And when you think about America and even the use, the term minority, um, very soon people not of color, well, amongst all of the racial groups, people not of color are not the majority anymore. So that saying was not just about numbers, it was a psychological thing to make you feel inferior. 
So us acknowledging that and releasing that. Me being the only one, I don't feel afraid. I don't feel less than, I feel special. And y'all see me, see y'all see me. So it's okay, <laughs> it's really okay. So just softening that. And of course, again, I'm never gonna take away from the fact that there are people in the world who want to make you feel bad, who aren't comfortable with you, but you don't have to carry that and you don't have to internalize that. So yeah, that's, that was beautiful. Um, anybody else? <clears throat> No more narratives. I'm gonna share some that I came up with additionally, um, that black women are the double negative in America. Being a woman and being black are two negative things. And I don't know how much you guys know about astrology and everything, but black and mother, we are, we make the whole thing go around. The world wouldn't be if it literally wasn't from us. And we carry every chromosome possible. We can make any kind of offspring possible in the world. So it's just unfortunate. And I haven't done, I haven't gotten the research to understand why things were flipped. But genetically and um, DNA wise, black women are superior to any other race gender combination scientifically <laughs> so just have that information if you didn't already know that um and also the narrative of us being least attractive or least respected um and also had that we're not represented enough um so yeah these are just narratives that whenever you hear other black women say sometimes it's easy for us to just fall into that conversation or give a you know shout out to that or agree with that but taking a moment to be more aware and decide I don't want to subscribe to that narrative anymore and I don't want to reinforce that in conversation and we shouldn't. That's the only way to get away from something is to stop subscribing to it. Um, and that's not saying that it's not out there happening in people's perspective, but you just not holding that space. So the next question is how do you reinforce those narratives through your own actions and speech? And this is the most um, challenging question because anytime we're experiencing something that doesn't feel good, we feel like it's harm being caused to us. So when we acknowledge that, yes, there's people that don't have our best interest in mind. And how am I also doing any additional work bringing harm to myself? How am I believing this narrative? How am I repeating it? How am I um, acting it out in my life? How am I avoiding situations that bring me prosperity because I'm subscribed to this narrative so deeply? So take a moment to answer that question. I'm gonna read it one more time. How do you reinforce those narratives throughout your own actions and speech?
Okay, let's give that about 60 more seconds. Okay. Armani, where are you at? Okay. So um, I said with the negative narratives, just agreeing with my sisters. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay because I've once felt that way and I just want to see them through that as well. But I also don't, mm -hmm. I don't always see the place or space to tell someone their experience is wrong or can be changed. But I now acknowledge that silence is also mm -hmm. an answer. So instead of agreeing or disagreeing, acknowledging that I just really don't have to say anything at all as well. Um, but action wise, working on um, working or being really overproductive because I can and my ancestors put in more work what's x y or z because of you know compared to their situation um but rest is also necessary so lots of dichotomies <laughs> here so that conversation of um feeling internally conflictive do I bond with sis right now on this comment she's saying because I'm with you I don't want you to think I'm not with you but also this is kind of toxic that is such a weird place to be. And even with me creating this, like I said, I'm happy to have been challenged to create this content because I had to really think through what's the best way that I can hold our hands through this conversation. Um, I was on a panel one time in Atlanta and we were talking about white people touching your hair. And I was like, um, I definitely, once I got over feeling insecure in my mind about it, I realized that it can be okay if it's a genuine experience and it's respectful, that's an opportunity for us to bond. Where else are they gonna touch black hair besides on a black person? And allowing someone to connect or touch you, hug you, be close, breaks some of that boundary down and it heals. And those girls in that audience was like, everybody like flipped their wigs back and was like, no ma'am. <laughs> so it was just like, so funny of like if you throw if you throw anyone for a loop who feels like you're bonded based on your cultural thing your gender thing it's it's a such a delicate conversation um but realizing that we can be harming each other by agreeing with things that are harming us you know i think that's a really great thing that you just said um anybody else <laughs> Chantel, crack it up. It's, it, look, it's not that, it's not the fact that I don't want them to touch my hair. I feel, like, <laughs> it's, it, I feel like it's the fact that they don't know how to touch my hair. Okay. Like, and then at the same time, you can't let everybody touch your hair because you don't know what kind of energy or like vibes they bring in because they could be like, oh, let me touch your hair. Like it looks, you know. Uh, or something and then it's like I don't really want you to touch my hair then like <laughs> it's definitely on a case-by-case -case basis and being 100% transparent I've definitely been in situations where people were trying to pet me because yeah, like all the way comfortable and that's not something I'm open to but I've had people literally a white woman just come across the room staring me and I, she's like you're gorgeous she's like please please can I and I'm like sure she hugged me first yeah. and then she just touched my eye for a little bit and she was like wow she's like you're amazing <laughs> and I felt so empowered by that. I'm like, this is great. This is great. I have a friend who's a really big YouTuber and her best friend is white and they intentionally do things to each other um, to 
pretty much create conversation and dialogue around sharing each other's experience and they literally do each other's hair so she has type four really kinky curly hair and the white best friend goes on camera and she gets the product she doesn't tell her which product is for what step and she's like just do what you think is right and she goes through it detangles combs it and then they do the reverse and just getting to know each other and I think it can be a healing opportunity if you feel comfortable, if this is someone you know or you're close to and you start to break down those barriers. Because at the end of the day, do we truly want to be connected? Do we truly want to be accepted? Do we truly want racism to go away? If so, that means we have to start doing things to connect. We have to start opening up. We have to indulge in opportunities that feel genuine. There's no way to get to know each other better if we stay separate. And definitely, I feel what you're saying in moderation and being selective because I will not allow somebody to pet me if it's on some like, you know, <laughs> some other stuff. <laughs> so yeah, but just going along with the concept that Armani is saying, like, so that takes me into, well, before I go into my next thing, is there anyone else that wants to talk about how they are uh, reinforcing any narratives? <clears throat> so my narratives were black women being objectified, but then also fetish fetishized. Mm -hmm. Fetishization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Boom. And why I believe both of those are true, right? I think uh sitting in uh being a light-skinned woman woman and thinking about the ways in which that is perpetuated, but for whom? Um and, and to what extent. And so sitting in like you know, how am I uplifting or affirming darker skinned women in my circles, right? Or in my family or acknowledging that like, right? Like, no, I'm not mixed, right? And like being, being, being qu questioning folks that are centering, uh, uh, right? Women and uh, foreignness and, and loving that, but not holding that I'm, right? That I'm just a black light skinned woman and that maybe master was in my family's closet, you know, in rooms at some point, but it's not about being, or centering a certain type of woman um, with a certain type of hair type, with a certain type of uh, mm -hmm. body frame. Um, so just holding all the, the complexity of how folks are reinforcing uh, either a preference of black women, us being uh, better stomached or better uh, um, acclimated and being amplified in social media or pop culture. Um, so while also demystifying that like, like the Kim K's of it all, like anyone that is perpetuating or harming uh, our narratives to be mm. all that we are because we're not a monolith right but I think starting as a light-skinned woman and holding that because I don't think oftentimes we sit in in the in the dialogue of it all I think we allow right ourselves to be positioned in a way that keeps us comfort comfortable and keeps us uh being uh you know seen as uh, a likable delicable like you know amicable black woman and that ain't true right and so just needing to always reinforce or uh, dismantle when I see other light-skinned women upholding that and or affirming to darker-skinned women that like, no, right? I, I will position you all to be in front and to be speakers and to be keynotes and to be whatever I need you to be and to pay you what you're, what you're worth as a light-skinned Black woman because I understand the narratives. But I think more of us have to do that internal work because we're expecting the world to shift um, and not really always seeing the ways that we uphold it. So yeah, just thinking that that's my, 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 my I have a role in that, um, right? So I think we all have a role. That was the most accountable thing I've probably heard in a long time because it's responsibility on top of responsibility. And the interesting part about all of this, it helps break down and I guess give more perspective to everyone's position based on what you just said, because this is the same thing we're asking of people who are not of color or people who are Asian or people who are closer to the preferred whatever to dismantle. And it just really brings a human aspect to the concept of everybody wants to be closer to right. Everyone wants to be closer to advantage. Everyone wants to benefit. Everyone wants to whatever. So wherever your position is in this life, on this color scale, on the cultural scale, if you feel like you're upholding any part of it, you're, we're all a part of the problem. And so within the black community, still not being cool with any of that happening amongst ourselves, that is huge, huge. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a little break from answering questions. 
and we're going to talk a little bit about psychology. So I want to give you guys three terms to write down. So one term is shared trauma. This second term is group think. And the final word is attachment. So shared trauma is one of the strongest bonds that humans can have. We both went through the same BS, we're connected. We both can relate on this, we're both uncomfortable in this, we both have the same type of challenges and that creates such a strong bond. And even though it feels really strong to be connected in that, it perpetuates it, it keeps it going. This is our story and our story that connects us is of struggle and trauma. And so keeping that in mind and understanding, just like Armani was saying, that pressure you feel when a black woman says something that you know is unhealthy or doesn't agree with, but you feel this pressure to like stay connected um, or people that continuously perpetuate the narratives over and over again, because it feels comfortable at a certain point. It makes you feel connected. So that group think concept um, was developed in 1971 actually. <clears throat> and they were talking about, it's really about the concept of individuals refraining from saying what they think or what their individual experience is to go along with the group. And then the attachment factor, being so attached to the stories. And that's what I'm saying. Like, if we really want to have a different experience, we have to let some things go let some of the narratives go, let some of the discomfort, let those moments be silent, like Armani said. <clears throat> so the next question that I have for you is based solely on your personal experience, what narratives are you ready to let go of that no longer serve you or were never actually yours? based solely on your personal experience, what narratives are you carrying that no longer serve you or were never really yours? What are you ready to let go of? <clears throat> so for me I released um that my experience is less than or held back because of my race or gender and to start viewing missed opportunities as redirection mm -hmm. yeah I just cannot um and just knowing, you know, beyond any human's effort or force, I'm going to have the experience that I'm supposed to have here. My destiny, if you will, my journey or whatever is much bigger than what anyone else's will can 
effect. And just opening myself up and realizing that me missing something or someone stopping something is just telling me I was going the wrong way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for pointing me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mine was the same, Jasmine, as yours. Um, and then what you talked about earlier about the double negative. Um, I feel like fear kind of uh, fuels my motivation. I think it. Sh I think I should be driven by something else now, and I feel like I need to identify what that is. Um, and definitely what Chantel brought up about Black women, you know, not being, you know, cherished and loved. And I think that. Uh, sometimes can like affect my relationships as well or you know I sometimes might internalize that or think that's why they failed so I think I think I need to let work on letting those go so yeah happy loving yourself because that's what this is about to turn into <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay anyone else okay so these next few questions are going to be quick um, and you don't have to write these down if you don't want to, it could be just dialogue. The next one is what is easy about being a black woman? This is our opportunity to change the narrative. What is easy about being a black woman? And if you can't think of something, make something up. What would you like to be easy about being a black woman? I'm definitely gonna say getting shit done. I feel like we are resilient. We make a way out of no way. It's gonna happen no matter what or who helps show up, don't show up, it's going down. That is something that I feel like a lot of us have in common. And it's easy to overcome. It's easy to move through. It's easy to accomplish. We hold the most degrees, race, gender combination in the United States. We own the most small businesses in the United States. It's nothing. <laughs> It's nothing. So yeah, using your imagination is also a really big part of social change. Someone has to reimagine a new future. What will this look like? What is easy about this? What will feel good? What is the advantage? How do we lead? How do we feel better? Um, going off that kind of, I the first thing that I kind of thought of was like, um like our intuition mm. and I feel like that kind of ties into what you were saying um because I just feel like as black women like we are so powerful mm -hmm. in like every aspect of life um and I think that that kind of comes from like our intuition and um like that power that we possess I think is like something that comes really um, easy. Absolutely. Definitely study um, astrology and the genetic codes of Black women, and it's going to just make you feel really, really empowered. Like, we come with so much extra stuff, antennas and capabilities, and we're truly, truly magical. Truly. Um, that's beautiful. Anybody else? Okay, definitely write that question down if you didn't have something come up so you can answer that question later. The more you imagine it, the more you're creating for all of us. And we definitely wanna create as much as possible. Um, so this one, what are some beautiful truths about your shared experiences with other black women? What's your favorite thing to high five another black woman about? What's something that we all can relate to? One thing for me is songs. There's so many times I'm in traffic and if I hear somebody playing Beyonce or Brandy or old Maya or old whatever, just looking at another black woman and we know we know this song and we know what it means to us. We connect so much on that and I think that's amazing. I would probably say um, like rhythm, like in, in sometimes rhythm and beat. I know there's a few black folk, like I, I've met a couple black women who like, girl, I can't braid, so don't say all black women braid. So I know not all of us got rhythm, but I think we all understand that we clap on the one and two and not the two and the three. I think there's just something <laughs> about when a beat drops, 
it's 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 ancestral. So yeah, even if you can't choreograph, you you it's some menu that got a rhythm that's just unspoken. That I think when we walk in rooms, people feel the beat, right? And that's why they get threatened. Um, mm -hmm because it's, it's something that we don't got to say, you know, it's in the body, it's in the way we move. I think that's what my Angelou's poem was about. It's just that like, hey, it's phenomenal, right? But it's, I would call it a rhythm um, is how I would explain it. Yes, and that definitely comes from our actual roots. Um, so I was having a conversation about Black people having telepathy. And they were like, I don't think that is exclusive to any other race. And I'm like, that's, and I don't realize because I'm a part of it. So, you know, if you're in a room, you could be in a room and there's only one other black woman and something crazy happening. Y'all just give each other the look and had a whole conversation. That's something that other races apparently don't experience. So we literally are tapped in that much more and have telepathy <laughs> within our culture. And that's amazing. Um, Okay, so the final question, which I will have you write out, is which shift in perspective can you commit to that will reduce stress and encourage self-care? What are you committed to moving forward? How will you shift your perspective about anything that we talked about today? What are you going to carry with you? You said what self-care practices was that what it was which shift in perspective can you commit to that will reduce stress and encourage self-care so what has your mind changed about today what's the new perspective what's the new outlook Um, I'll share. So I think that like going from today, like I'm, I mean, it would, it would definitely like in the long term, like reduce stress or it would in the short term, definitely reduce stress and in the long term, but for sure in the long term, like apply to self-care as well. But I think just really like questioning those narratives that we talked about, especially, um, within like those black spaces where it may be like considered more toxic um to like address and i guess maybe be, like the the odd one out when you have maybe like different ideas on on um like kind of societal narratives that have been like placed on um us so that's mm -hmm. a shift in perspective that i'm going to commit to just like really like dissecting all of the things that I subscribe to in my like conversations. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you two tips to carry with you before you uh, counter someone because it's so easy for it to be a defensive conversation. Share your intention. I just love you. I want the best for you, whatever the intention is and acknowledge how they're feeling before you say what you're gonna say. And that makes it much easier for them to swallow that pill. Cause you definitely don't wanna, you know, start to upset someone really. <laughs> right, so I wrote those down because I can come off aggressive sometimes too. So that's perfect for me. Let's say uh, direct and intentional. Cause that aggressive where you know they call black women that all the time. And I am very much, with you on like I just say straight up I just say what it is and there's nothing aggressive about it it's just very direct yeah no sugar no coat anybody else <laughs> um what you said about like welcoming others like if we want to be like accepted we have to allow people to accept us so like being able to share myself with others like I'm very much confident in who I am but like also like sharing like me being a black woman to somebody who else is not black or a woman like fitting in that like having them understand me when they want to understand me and also not like forcing myself on to other people like 
you know, sometimes you get frustrated when people don't understand or they're just like, okay, and you just like, I will break it down for you if you need it, but like holding myself back and being able to like accept myself in those situations. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to be amazing. And you guys remember too that every single thing you do, every interaction that you have with someone that changes them, changes the world, literally. You having that you penetrating and affecting someone, they're going to go and be different in the world. And the people they come in contact are going to be different and going to be different. So always take those opportunities. Definitely consider yourself a teacher now. Anybody else? Okay. So you have all of those questions. I'll definitely send these questions to Armani to send you in an email so you can just review. And I'll also send the content and articles that I have pulled to help me collect some of this information. Um, do you guys have any questions? Amazing. I feel like I did my job. So yeah, Jasmine, do you have like a blog or a YouTube channel? I just like everything you say and you're like, you like are educating me left and right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a podcast. I have a YouTube. I'm on Instagram. <laughs> I'm on Twitter. Uh, and I'm actually redoing all of that stuff right now. So all the content I have will be there, but I'm having to be dating a filmmaker now. So my I'll have way better content for everybody. Um, so yes, I'll have all of that information in the follow-up email that Armani will send you. And if anyone has anything besides, well, in addition to this <clears throat> or different from this and you want to do deeper work, I do personal sessions. So we can go through a coaching session. On Tuesdays, I do yoga. If you want to join that, it's really mindful. It's really challenging. Um, so yeah, you're invited to whatever I'm doing. So I'll make sure we're connected. And I had a blast. Thank y'all so much for going through this with me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Oh, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you, Armani, for having me. Thank you, Emerald. Thanks for being down. That was amazing. <laughs> cool, so I'll let you close it out. I actually have one question. Please um do you have any um like I know you were talking about like doing research on like um like our genetic codes and stuff like that do you have any like references or like anything that you would refer me to or anything like that let me go through and look at old YouTube videos that I've watched and old articles that I have okay. and there's a few books on my shelf too that I can look in so let me write down to create like a whole understanding the black woman starter pack beautiful books and um also there is this so the invention of race and the history of white people and the only reason i'm bringing that up is because the history of white people helps you understand how the structure of race even came about mm -hmm. and i generally like currently i try to steer away from making white and black synonymous or interchangeable like talking about black doesn't mean white has to be a part of the conversation at all. So definitely acknowledging that, but I think for us to just realize that this really is an illusion that everyone is playing hardball about helps alleviate some of it. So I'll send all of that. Anything else? Thank you so yeah. much. You're so welcome. All right, Armani, take it away. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I hope everyone gained something from this. Uh, thank you so much, Jazz, for walk or bringing us through this experience today. Um, so I will mention that we, uh, as Jazz's raffle, one of these will actually be raffled off to someone. Um, so we will definitely get back to uh, to you on the process on how we'll go ahead and do that. But um, yeah, I really appreciated everyone coming today. We have a class, a yoga class with Jazz tomorrow at 10 a.m. Yes, 10 a.m. PST. Um, then we will have Nicole's radical self-care session at 4.30 on Monday. And then her last session will be 
next Thursday for sound healing. So um, if any of that is interest is of interest to you, I encourage you to also come tell your friends the kind of experiences you've been having here. Um, and just wanting to also just create this culture and this this feeling and sense that we deserve experiences like this. And um, yeah, I just really want everyone to, to take something from this and share. So um, if there's anything else from Emerald or anyone else here, um, please go ahead and unmute or however you'd like to express. Um, I just wanna say thank you, uh, Jasmine, for being community with us again, a second time of just your time and, and energy. I feel it here virtually. So I appreciate you showing up and giving us a little bit of that. I think everyone's taking that away as you exit our virtual space today. I do wanna ask you all um, just to drop our money and I maybe one tidbit thing you took away from the space so that we can capture uh, some qualitative data so that we can continue to bring you all uh, Black Women's Forum type events year to year. Um, and just also so we can maybe share that back with Jasmine for her to use in whatever ways are most helpful for her. So yeah, just take a moment. I know you wrote a lot of things down. You can definitely uh, keep it as, as confidential as you need to, but hopefully you can share just one takeaway from us. That way we have that, the, your voices left in the, in the chat with us as you exit. So just wanna say thank you for doing that and thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So I know you said you would have a yoga class every Tuesday. Do you have a, um, how, how long will you be doing your weekly classes? Cause this is newer for you again. It is. Um, so the virtual weekly Tuesday night class, it's been consistent for two months now. Oh, wow. Okay. And I plan on being able to maintain it. Um, even when I travel. So I definitely picked the evening thing. So I plan on going to Thailand before the year is over and I'll still be able to maintain that time here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been consistent. I plan on committing to doing it as long as I can. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then a retreat as well. Will that, will that have any virtual components? No. So the retreat will be in August in Tulum, Mexico. And that retreat can't be virtual because we'll be using plant medicine um, to be a part of the transformational journey. And that's going to be a really deep, deep work process It's a six day retreat. And at the end, we'll play and have fun for sure. But it's definitely going to be intensive with meditation and practice and breath work and psychedelics and purging and the whole nine um, and beauty and healing and connectivity, eye gazing, like all my favorite things so that'll happen in august um i'll get armani's email address or get armani to give me everyone's email address and i'll subscribe everyone to my newsletter so anytime i do a retreat a special event a virtual thing ig live you'll have that information cool did you guys already like book the retreat and have everyone set that's going not yet so we are going to announce it within two weeks. We're putting okay. the final speeches on the um, the hotel that we're going to buy out. So yeah, well, you'll have that information. I would love to have you there. All right, cool. Anything else, Amanda? No, just making sure that we get some, some feedback in the okay. chat. That's all. OK, got you. <laughs> I cannot go. Is over. <laughs> yes, as long as I'm assuming everyone is over 21 on this call. Okay, yes, you are more than welcome to come. Um, <clears throat> I missed this too, but you were talking about the genetic codes of Black women. Is that what you said? Yes. So the DNA of a Black woman, we literally can make any combination of human on the earth. Mm hmm <clears throat> but then what was the astrology part that's what I think I was missing so the di the divine feminine and I don't want to say which planet it was but something shifted earlier last year that literally meant activation of the black woman do you mm -hmm. remember I remember Juanika telling me but I don't remember what planet it was I think it uh, was say it again I think it was one of the nodes though right I'm going to text her and ask her to make sure. Okay. 
I but think she was, like, was giving me a reading telling me about that and she went live talking about that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if anyone's curious who we're talking about I'll put her Instagram in the chat too okay yeah thank you for sharing space with us and um yeah guiding us through this really appreciate it you are so welcome i'm going to log off you ladies have an amazing rest of your life <laughs> bye y'all bye jazz thank you bye bye guys